Hola a todos. Bienvenidos a todos. Welcome on this beautiful Friday afternoon, Friday evening. Welcome to En Casa con la Plaza, brought to you by La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, your friendly neighborhood museum right across from Olvera Street. Currently closed, but we'll, I think we'll be opening soon. Anyway, we're here today as we are at least three times a week to tell those little told stories of our community through this virtual platform that we have, which has made it possible for us to connect with you and to be in touch with you and for you to be in touch with us. We have a very special program for you tonight. I think uh, some of you are ready with your bottles and your glasses and your, your snacks, your botanas. But here to introduce our special guest, we have our CEO, El Señor John Echeveste. Take it away, John. Thank you. Thank you, Abelardo. Good to see everybody here tonight, virtually anyway. And uh, nice to have you here uh, during this happy hour time here in, uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, good night to have a glass of wine and unwind uh, from, from the week. And what we're going to do tonight is take uh, a little road trip, a little road trip down the freeway to uh, Valle de Guadalupe in Baja, California. And, you know, we're really, really fortunate that uh, Baja and the Valle are just less than a three-hour drive from us here in L.A. Uh, Valle de Guadalupe is considered one of the top-rated wine destinations, not in California, but in the world. In, in, in the world. And uh, it's even closer to us than uh, Napa and Sonoma. And the nice thing about the Valle is that it has so much authentic charm. Um, you know, 20 years ago, there were just a handful of wineries down there. Uh, today, there are about 150, from what I understand. And they're all friendly, outgoing. The, the staff is more than willing to, to help you go through a, a great wine tasting experience there. And it's a great way to spend a weekend because um, the Valle now has many nice uh, boutique hotels, excellent, excellent uh, restaurants as well, all kinds of restaurants. And um, they have a lot of good festivals down there regularly too. So. It's a great weekend destination uh, at the plaza. We took a group down last year that, uh, that uh, Gil and uh, Pedro led for us for a weekend. We had about 15 people or so and had an absolutely uh, wonderful time down there and experienced uh, I, what I remember of it. Uh, we experienced uh, more wineries than, uh, than I can recall and just some, some great, great food there. Uh, so it's a great place to go. And we have what this tonight uh, two people who know the Valle better than any. Um, one is uh, our friend here, Gil Gutierrez. Raise your hand, Gil. And, Hi, John. Uh, good Hello. to see you again, Gil. Far off downtown. Uh, Gil with his uh, partner in wine, not partner in crime, but partner in wine, uh, Eloisa Cruz. Uh, import uh, some of the better wines from the Valle. Uh, which they provide to uh, supermarkets and some of the finer restaurants here in LA. And Gil can tell you uh, a little bit more about that. And uh, also with us is uh, Pedro de Poncelli. And Pedro is a second generation vintner who uh, uh, has been making wines there since uh, 2004. And he's going to introduce us tonight to a couple of his uh, finer bottles, as well as talk about, I think, some uh, some new bottles that are, that are going to be coming out soon. So it'll be an exciting night. Um, Gil provided a, uh, a link to purchase the wine, which we have here, one of the ones. And if you weren't able to purchase that in time for the tasting tonight, you can still contact Gil. And if he's really nice, he'll deliver it to your home or arrange for you to, uh, to pick it up. Uh, somewhere, and you can then show this later, um, uh, catch it on our YouTube feed, and enjoy the wine with it. Or you can just enjoy it with whatever wine you may you may have right now with you, and we'll we can talk about that too. So uh, with that, let's let's begin our journey to to the Valle, 
And Gil, why don't you uh, why don't you take it and I'll lurk in the background and enjoy my wine here and tell us all about it. The parrots have arrived, so they'll provide provide a little background uh, scenery for us too. Nice. Well, well, th thank you, John. Thank you for the introduction. You know, we love everybody. Uh, Plaza, you guys are, are more like a family. Appreciate that. And uh, before we start, I also want to say thank you for everybody that purchased the wines. We, we appreciate it. And everybody else that's with us, thank you for joining us. It, it's a pleasure to be here with every, everyone. So we are going to be tasting two wines tonight. We've got uh, both of the wines are from Pedro de Poncelis. And the, uh, the first one that we're going to do, we'll start off with the, uh, the Cap Tempranillo. This is going to be a lot of fun. It's very casual. You know, it, it's, we're just kind of, we're going to go with the flow. So I'm here in downtown LA, Pedro is in Ensenada, and um, if everybody else, we've got some people from Mexico City, you know, we've got some people from LA, so it's going to be a nice group. So why don't we start off with the, the first one we're going to do, let's start off with the, uh, the Cab Tempranillo. So if, uh, if you guys have your bottles and you haven't opened, now's a good time to open them up because these wines are, are pretty big. So typically what I use, I, I like to use a decanter that kind of helps open them up first. But if you didn't, we could just uh, open them up in the, uh, the glass here. And that's also kind of fun because you get an idea of how the wine's gonna evolve. You know, th think of it as when you first open up a wine bottle, it's like a, like a fetus, like a baby when he's first born. He's unbalanced, different colors. So same thing with the, uh, the wine bottle. When you first open it, it's gonna be fighting amongst the fruits, the oak, the alcohol. And the first thing you're gonna get is the, uh, the big alcohol. So by opening it up, letting it breathe, pouring a little bit in the glass, maybe about two, two to three ounces and swirling it, that'll give it time to kind of air, open up a little bit. And you'll see that, that big alcohol kind of uh, going away, the natural fruit comes out. So let's start off with the, uh, the Cap Tempranillo. It's a blend of two grapes, 50% Cab from uh, Valle de Guadalupe. And then the, uh, the other 50% Tempranillo comes from uh, San Vicente de las, del Valle. So there's a couple of sub-regions in Valle de Guadalupe that Pedro's gonna talk about. So get that, that Cab Tempranillo open, pour yourself some, and then we'll start tasting. So uh, in the meantime, uh, once, once you guys are, are, uh, are ready, looks like uh, I'm ready, so hopefully you guys are ready. Let's introduce Pedro and he's gonna continue and he's gonna talk a little bit more in depth about El Valle de Guadalupe. So I present to you guys Pedro de Poncilis. Hello, my friends. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Because I have a, I had a little problem just before the session starts. So well, we are online. You sound great. So I can hear you fine. Salute. So, salute, salute. Well. Uh, what an honor. It's a great pleasure to be with, uh, with you, my friends. I want to thank you to La Plaza, to John, and to Abelardo that, uh, well, are welcoming me. And also, I want to, to thank Gilberto and Eloisa from um, Vinos Los Angeles that uh, is a, a new uh, importer. They are our uh, uh, importers and distributors in the United States. So I really want to thank you to having me there or here. And um, well, who am I? I am uh, Pedro Poncelis. I am a sommelier uh, from 23 years. I have been uh, working in the wine business. Uh, first as a sommelier, then uh, I started to to work in a commercial uh, part in, in an import company. And then uh, in 2004, I started to to make wine. So I have been uh, in the in the wine business in, in different ways. Uh, but definitely uh, the one that I most enjoy is, is the winemaking. So we have a, a winery here in Ensenada, Vinicola Punto de Aparte. And also I have a, a online project, uh, it's a, a wine school that I'm going to tell, to tell you about that later. Um, and I prepared some, some info about uh, our region 
and uh, I want to talk about the Baja California wine region and a little bit of the history and uh, well uh, just to learn and to understand what is what is happening right now has been an amazing um, an amazing um, I will say around uh, 30 these last 30 years has been incredible a lot of uh, new projects new wineries the quality has been improving a lot but the history of the winemaking in Baja California started uh, so long uh, every everything uh, started with the uh, Spain people that used to live in in Mexico and uh, well now Mexico the new the new Spain in the 1500s and um, look at this map is dated in 1650 that was California now California is in the United States but in the past California was the name of the the of the territory of now the Baja California everything started here then in the peninsula and then in the time you started to to go up I, I want to make a, a pause because uh, I forgot do you have the wine now in in the glass and I will probably I want to talk a little bit about the wine we are um, having um, the Cabernet Tempranillo this is a blend of a 50% Cabernet Sauvignon and a 50% Tempranillo. The Cabernet Sauvignon is coming from Guadalupe Valley. The Tempranillo is coming from San Vicente. Very, very important. This is a wine that has 24 months in French oak barrels. French oak barrels that gives uh, to the wine a little bit more complexity. It's a full body, high presence of aromas and flavors, very, very long in the mouth. It's a wine that uh, can go with uh, good meat, uh, dishes with good flavor, cheeses with good intensity. And I will say that this is the style of the wines right now in, in Baja California. Our wines, not only mine, all of the wines that we produce here in the region used to, used to be, um, I will say, wines that has a lot of power, a lot of, a lot of intensity, a lot of personality, good body, and also a good alcohol. I will explain uh, in a few minutes why is um, is the, the this the style of the region, um, and mostly it's because of our, our our weather conditions and our location. We are a very very special spot in the in the in the country. The weather that we have here in Baja California is unique in the whole country. Uh, if you check the weather report in the central part of Mexico or other parts of Mexico, uh, a lot of rain or a lot of heat. Um, but, but here we are in a very fresh um, uh, and a very, I will say, um, what's the word? A special weather that n doesn't exist in the rest of the country in Mexico. I know that you understand that because we share the same weather, this Mediterranean weather, hot days, cold nights, and very, very important, the influence of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and uh, how many days we woke up and the fog is around our, our houses, around our mountains, around our valleys. And then in the midday, sunny days, and then in the night, again, the cold. These are the specific conditions of the Mediterranean weather. Uh, also very important, our rain season in the winter. So right now, there are sometimes just a few rains, but just a few and very little. So right now we are in the, in the ripening season of the grapes. So grapes in the day with the sun starts to, to, to get more sugar, more color, more aromas, more flavors. And then in the night with the cold, the, the grapes uh, keeps that inside of them. So uh, that helps us to get a better ripeness. With that, at the end of the season, we start to harvest white grapes in July, uh, August, and then red grapes in the end of August, September, October, and sometimes November. 
So when the, the growing season ends and harvest comes, grapes have, has a lot of uh, ripeness, a lot of concentration. That's the reason that uh, why we are producing wines with a very good intensity, very good flavor, very good aroma, and very good concentration. You can, of course, in all the parts of the world, you can produce wines in different styles, but mostly here in the region, I will say this, this what, uh, is the finest and uh, is, um, um, well, a uh, very important uh, thing to share. Okay, I'm going back to, to the presentation and I'm going to continue to talk about uh, what I prepared to do so about in California. So where, where the history began? Okay, everything began in, in the past, in the, around uh, 1535. Um, okay, give me a second. Okay, there. Look the map right now. Now California is in the United States and now we are Baja California. That's unfair, totally unfair, because California, as I showed you in the map, was the peninsula. But then in the time, the, the place extends to the north, and the people in that time used to say the Alta California and Baja California. And at the end, uh, the American people just take the Alta and keep the California name, and we ended with the Baja California. But well, anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is that um, uh, the grapes arrived to, to the region uh, uh, in the south part of the peninsula. I have a mark right here. Let me open my, my highlighter right there. And you will see here, probably you are, oops, prob probably you are familiar with Los Cabos. And very, clo very close to Los Cabos is La Paz. And very close to La Paz is also Loreto. Right now, La Paz is a large city, and Loreto is a very nice and beautiful small town. But uh, in the past, Loreto was the capital of the California island. That's why they supposed uh, there, this, this territory was an island. They did, the, the, the Spain people in that time, they, did, they didn't knew that there was a connection in the upper part. So they always thought that this was an island. And uh, this history started with Hernán Cortés. Hernán Cortés for Mexican people is really important because he was in charge the, of the process of the conquest of the Aztecs. So he established the Spain colony in our territory. That colony was named the New Spain and in the time that became Mexico. So Hernán Cortés uh, was a very important promoter of uh, vine growing and he started a large uh, wine production also and uh, amazing because it wasn't in Baja California at all. The first vineyards located in, in our territory was located in, in the central part of Mexico. The first vineyards in the whole continent were located uh, in the proximities of now Mexico City. Uh, in the surroundings of today Mexico City, you will find the colonial cities like Querétaro, Guanajuato, Puebla, and others. Well, in those cities and in the surroundings, the first vineyards were established, most of them by the people commanded by Hernán Cortés. When Hernán Cortés uh, finished the process of the conquer of the Aztecs, they start to look another empires to conquer. So they went to the south, and finally they uh, found the Inca Empire, and they got it too. And uh, that happened between uh, 1510, 1530. But in 1535, uh, a rumor uh, just got to Hernán Cortés. And uh, he heard about an island located uh, to the left of the continent, and it was a special island, because in this island, uh, only women lived in, in that island, black uh, women, beautiful black women, like Amazonas, no men lives in the island, and the only metal that you can find in the island is gold. So um, that rumor, well, obviously uh, called attention to Cortés, 
and he decided that he was going to explore the, the Pacific Ocean just to see if this is true or not. So he ordered the construction of five uh, big boats and started to, to explore the uh, Gulf of California. Uh, what he found was a lot of small islands and suddenly he found a large, large territory. And he disembarked in this place. This place is located in La Paz. So he disembarked in the south part of the peninsula. This place is named La Bahía de Tres Cruces, and now is well known as La Paz, La Paz City, that is around uh, 150 kilometers from Los Cabos. So this is the place where, where Hernán Cortés uh, disembarked, looking for, for these Amazonas, looking for the gold, of course, but unfortunately, he didn't find anything. Where this legend about the Amazonas and everything started? Well, results that in, in, in 1510, there was um, a, a writer, a Spain writer, that he wrote just a novel, a history, invited history in his mind, write it as a novel. The name of the, of the book is The Sergas of Esplandian. In, in, his, in English, it's like the, advent the Adventures of the Swordsman. And um, everything was uh, invented. It wasn't true. But, uh, well, Hernán Cortés uh, heard the rumor and, and he believed in it. So he started the exploration. So when he disembarked in, in Baja California, in La Paz, in that time, uh, he found nothing. Uh, the only thing he found was the natives, very, very aggressive natives, that uh, they went to fight, and uh, there was a huge battle, and a lot of Spain people died in that in that uh, moment. So it was a terrible, terrible situation. Um, so Hernán Cortés took the decision, and he went back to to the mainland, uh, and and he forgot about uh, the the California islands. Um, took a lot, a lot, a lot of time to the next step. It was in the 1697, uh, it's um, around uh, 162 years later, then another group of Spain people decided to come, to explore, and to finish uh, the conquer of the California Island. So they came, but in, in another position. Who came in that time? The people from the church, the missionaries. So the first missions that were established in the Californias, the first one was established in 1697 uh, in Loreto. Loreto was the first mission, and you can see the image is an, is an actual image of the, of the mission, the mission of Loreto is uh, in a very, very nice condition. The town is, is a small town, beautiful town, and uh, beautiful uh, beaches and islands in the surroundings. So it's a very, very nice place to visit when, when we can travel again. Um, this is the first mission established in, in Baja California. I think I don't need to, to, to tell you what is important of the missions in Baja and in California, in both countries. Uh, the origin of our cities and our important towns was established in these missions and in the surroundings. But interesting, until this moment, no vineyards. The first vineyards were established. Uh, ah, here, this is an, a nice, nice image. You can see here. Let me take another, you know, again, my, my highlighter. Here in the south is Cabo, Cabo San Lucas. Then you can find in this bay is where Cortés disembarked. And then here a little bit more in the north, you can find Loreto. 40 kilometers from Loreto, inside in, in the mainland, in the, well, not in mainland, but in, inside in the mountains and, and the, in the, this area, it's surrounded by mountains and, and nothing. Um, the missionaries found some water, and they also found some uh, colonies of natives. So his mission was teach them the Catholic religion and convert them to the Catholicism. 
So they started their job and they established another mission. The second mission of Baja California, named San Javier. This is the mission of San Javier established in the 1717 by Juan de Ugarte. Juan de Ugarte, for, for the people of, uh, of wine, uh, is very important because he is the father of the winemaker in, in the Californians. He was the first missionary that decided to plant vines and olives. So um, uh, the first vineyards uh, in, in Baja California were established by the missionaries. In Baja California, there were no grapes, so they need to, to, to brought it from other places. Mostly the grapes that arrived to Baja California came from the central part of Mexico. And uh, everything started there. So that's why it's so important and that's why I am telling you this because the, the huge wine industry that is now, uh, that now exists in, in California, in the United States and, and the important industry that we have in Mexico, everything started in that mission in that moment, in that year, in the 1717. But in the past, the first approach from the Spain people to the region was in the 1535 with Hernán Cortés. So imagine in a line of time, how many years uh, needed to, to, to pass and to go to, to the, the, the things that start to happen. So um, it's, it's really impressive. And if you have time later, you can go to Google Maps and look for Mission of San Javier and you will see that it's in the middle of nothing. Sometimes I am, uh, I used to ask myself, what the hell are the, the, the missionaries were doing in walking in the mountains, in the deserts with nothing, uh, sometimes nothing to drink and nothing to eat. But well, they were in the, in the job looking for the natives to convert them to the, to the Catholic religion. Look, one of the olive trees that is, uh, uh, you can find this tree in the surroundings of the San Javier Mission. It's an olive tree that has uh, more than 250 years old. It's, it's amazing. And you can find also some vines, not in San Javier, but in other missions in the Baja California, uh, you can find vines that has more than 200, 250 years old. So it's, uh, in terms of the history, it's just uh, spectacular. But then, um, the the first missionaries that arrived to the region were the Jesuits. But then they had a problem with, uh, with the king in Spain and they were expelled. Then the Franciscans came, but also had more problems and they were expelled. And the, the labor, the mission was finished by the Dominics. So all the orders of the religion were here present, uh, not only here in Baja California, also in, in California and United States, establishing these missions that uh, is the beginning, as I said, of uh, some of the important cities that we have in both Californias. Getting close to our region and getting close to the Guadalupe Valley. Uh, it's funny because now Guadalupe Valley is the most famous valley in the whole country. And I will say now it's starting to get some recognition in the world. But it's funny because Guadalupe Valley was the last valley established in the north part of Baja California. Uh, is not the largest uh, in production, but is very well located. It's located between Ensenada and Tijuana, Ensenada and Tecate, Ensenada and Mexicali. So uh, when you come to Ensenada, the, the three ways that you have uh, to get here, you cross the Guadalupe Valley. So because of the location closer to the border, closer to the Tijuana airport, closer to the largest cities in the state, well, uh, people start to come more often to Guadalupe Valley than the other valleys. I will show you some maps and I will show you that uh, what are the valleys right now that we have in, in our region. And, um, well, everything in the north started in the Santo Tomas Valley in 1791. I'm going to remember this. 1717 is when Juan de Ugarte established the first mission, the first vineyard in the San Javier Mission. So it took 64 years from San Javier to Santo Tomas Valley 
to to the vines to arrive to to the north part and to establish the fir vineyards in a valley that is named the Valley of Santo Tomas. Santo Tomas Valley is located uh, 40 kilometers from Ensenada to the south. Uh, it's really close. It's about, around half, half an hour. Um, in this valley, uh, almost 100 years later, the first winery was established in our region. This winery is Santo Tomas Winery. That, uh, in a good way for us, the, the winery, Santo Tomas Winery, is still running, is still in operations. It's the oldest winery in uh, Baja California, located in the Santo Tomas Valley, and is where everything started in the north part. Here, this is going to be interesting. I will show you uh, in this, in this uh, uh, I am uh, marking it in red, in this region you will find the Santo Tomas Valley. Uh, a little bit later in the south, you can find the San Vicente Valley. I have a, a, another start here in the middle of the peninsula, but there is no valley. Uh, what I wanted to show you is where is located the highest peak in the chain of mountains that runs in the middle of the peninsula. This peak is named the Picacho del Diablo and is almost uh, uh, well, a little bit more than 9,000 feet above sea level. So with this, I can show you how high is the change of mountains that is running from California, is running in this, uh, in this uh, direction here. Here in the middle, you will find Sierra de Juarez and Sierra de San Pedro Martir. Here, just on the side of Picacho del Diablo, we have a very important observatory, San Pedro Martir Observatory. And why is located there? Because of the altitude and because, obviously, there is not almost any, any no population in the surroundings. So the skies are very clear. They do not have a luminic pollution. So for terms of the astronomy, that's important and they can see, the astronomers, they can see very good the sky. So these mountains are really, really, really important for our valleys. I am showing you here in the south of Ensenada is Santo Tomas. Here in the south is also San Vicente. And uh, there you will see in the... Oops, oh, let me, let me, I have a problem here, because Chris, okay, right. Uh, here you will find Ensenada. Then in the north, a little bit, you will find Guadalupe Valley. Uh, Guadalupe Valley is around 15 kilometers from Ensenada. But if you see, everything is happening in the state that is exposed to the Pacific Ocean. Look in the image. You have the peninsula, the north part, half are exposed to the sea, to the Pacific Ocean, and the other half um, is obviously not exposed. And you will see immediately that there is nothing. It's just sand and is a region that has a lot of heat. So the good condition for uh, vine growing and, and wine making is obviously in the, in the part that is exposed to the influence, to the currents of the Pacific Ocean that give us the possibility to have hot days, but cold nights and our rains in the winter. In the other part, like example in Mexicali, they very often are in more than 110 uh, degrees because, uh, well, they are in the middle of, of the desert. So it's uh, similar to, to talk about California and Arizona. Uh, California with a very nice weather and Arizona in, in a very hot condition. So we are protected by the mountains that are very high. And the, the highest peak is that Picacho del Diablo. Um, talking about the Guadalupe Valley, is interesting because I was telling you is the last of the valleys established in, in, in the region, is the youngest. 
the valley was established officially in 1906. There were a first attempt to, to colonize the region. Who was living in, this, in these lands? The natives. What natives? Well, Indians that belonged to the ethno-linguistic group of the Jumanos. Same Indians that Jews or same natives that used to live in also the, the west coast of uh, now the United States. So from this group of Jumanos, you can find a lot of different tribes. Here in Baja California, the tribes that used to live were the Kukapas, the Kiliwas, the, Ju the um, Pai Pais, and a little bit more in the south, the Cochimis and the Pericues. But right here in, in now our lands, Ensenada, Guadalupe Valley, the, the Kiliwas were the, 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 the natives that used to live in, in our region. So there was a, another Spain uh, missionary, Felix Caballero, that founded in today Guadalupe Valley the first mission. The mission, I'm going to say it in Spanish, La Misión de Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe del Norte. And he started uh, his labor, his job, trying to convince the native to, to get into Catholicism, but they didn't want. So he took a very, very bad decision. He asked to the help to, to the militars, to the, to the army. So when the army came in today, Guadalupe Valley, natives were so upset and they started a huge fight. And Felix Caballero almost died in the battle. So the natives just destroyed the mission, they put a fire in, in it. And it's interesting because in 1835, we were already a country as Mexico with an army and laws and government. But those territories belonged to the, to the natives and was a very complicated situation. Took more than 70 years, again, a lot of time, and then arrived to the region in the 1906, arrived a colony, you will not believe it, of Russians. The Russians are in everything, right? These Russians were looking at uh, asylum. They were expelled from their country uh, because religious problems. And uh, some of them arrived to now California, specifically LA. And from there, they ex expand to, to different regions. A group of 100 families heard about some lands in Mexico. So he, they asked the, to the government, in that time Porfirio Diaz was the president, and they got the authorization, they got the asylum. So the government had a plan, of course. The government said, well, we cannot control that land. Probably if we put the Russians over there, the natives will go away and happened. So government made a deal with the Russians. Okay, you can take this line to the Guadalupe Valley for 50 years. After 50 years, if you want to stay, you need to buy it. And if not, you need to leave. And the Russians said, we don't have problem. Uh, we don't want problem, and uh, we're okay with that. So they established in the 1906 uh, the Russian colonizing company of Baja California. And these 100 families from Russia established here in today Guadalupe Valley. So, yes, the Guadalupe Valley, the, the most famous uh, wine region in the country, was established by the Russians. Tell me. Uh, if not, but uh, I think this is just amazing and it's a little bit crazy. Um, then, what happened? Well, another another people from other different parts of the world start to arrive. For us, and also in California happened too, Italians were very, very important. We started to welcome some Italian migrants that established uh, some vineyards and started the production of some wine. Uh, one of the first was Don Angelo Cheto. Why is Don Angelo important in this history? Well, today, the largest winery we have in Mexico is L.A. Cheto. Uh, Don Angelo arrived in Mexico in 1928. 
And almost 100 years later, almost 100 years later, Cheto is producing the half of the production of the Mexican wine. Who will, who will believe it in that time, right? Then another Italian, Esteban Ferro, arrived to, to Baja, and he was a winemaker, the knowledgeist in Santo Tomas. And Esteban Ferro started to bring uh, fine uh, varieties. I mean, Vitis vinifera varieties. In terms of the varieties, you will find there are thousands of different grape varieties, and not all of them are good for wine. So when the Italians arrived to, to our region, they found the grapes that were planted by the missionaries, but the grapes that they were using, they were, they were not good enough to make good wine. So the Italians started to bring from Italy uh, new grapes, like Neviolo, like Barbera, like Sangiovese, and then the quality of the wine started to grow slowly, very, very slowly, but it started to grow and the region started to develop. Then in the 70s arrived, um, um, he was Mexican, but he was uh, in a partnership, in association with the Spain company. Uh, I am talking about Don Antonio Ariza, Mexican businessman that he made a partnership and association with Domecq Brothers from Spain. And they established here in Baja California, Domecq Mexico. Domecq Mexico used to be one of the largest wineries in the country, the largest actually, more than Cheto. But uh, well, unfortunately, Don Antonio Ariza passed away in the 90s. And when that happened, the family sold the company and, and the company lost all the, all the importance. So, um, also in the 65, 1965, arrived to the region Camilo Magoni. I will say that for me today, Camilo is, is a legend here in, in our region. Is the, the enologist, the winemaker that has been producing wines from, from more than 50 years in our region. He has been living more experiences than all the winemakers, all the rest of the winemakers together. That's it. So uh, he used to be the winemaker in Cheto for almost 50 years, for, of almost 50 years. And now he has his own winery, Casa Magoni. So um, those are situations that, uh, well, started to, to build, to create, so the, the wine industry that we have right now. But I have to say this very clear. Before the 80s, the wine that was produced here in our region was not so good. And actually, being honest, I have to say it was very bad. But in the 80s, a group of friends, Mexican friends, decided that they were going to establish a winery that were going to produce world-class wines and um, that the philosophy and the mentality of the winemakers in the region needed to change. So these friends founded Monte Chani in 1986. And I will have to say that the wine history in our region and in Guadalupe Valley we divided in two parts. Before Monte Chani, the past, the bad wines, and after Monte Chani, the, the new era. This last 30 years, as, as was saying in the beginning of my talking, has been amazing. The quality has been improving a lot. Technology, the new wineries that you can find. Imagine, in 1986, there were no more than 10 wineries in the whole region. Now we are more than 200. So uh, everything started in that point. So that's, that's a, an important moment in our history. And uh, there is Monte Chanique in the top of the mountain. I have to say that this is the old building. Uh, four years ago, the, they, they uh, started a huge remodelation. And the new winery, I will show you 
in a few minutes. Uh, it's now very modern and very nice, but it's, it's a very, very important uh, a moment for, for the wine making in, in Mexico. Also very, very important um, uh, in, uh, <laughs> I, I use the, the translator and, and uh, translate the, uh, translate the name of the wine, but uh, well, in 1997, in the presentation, you will see the first stone wine. Okay, forget about it. What I mean is in 1997, there is a, a winery named Casa de Piedra, stone house. Um, and this Casa de Piedra started to produce um, a wine with very good quality. But the important thing is that this winery was very, very small. It was a family project producing only 2,000 cases per year. And, and that's it. And um, that was very, very important because after Casa de Piedra, what happened is that almost all these 200 new wineries that we have right now, we are precisely small wineries. Family wineries producing less than 5,000 cases per year. Uh, I need to give you numbers. In this way, you will understand better what I am saying. Like example, Cheto. Cheto produced one million cases per year. So in the past, people used to think in wineries and obviously used to think in large wineries. I am talking about hundreds of thousands of, of cases production. And obviously, for almost all the people, that was impossible. So the good point here with Casa de Piedra that was established in the 1997, is that they started to produce very good wines in a small family winery. And then we reply the model. So now we have, I told you, more than 200 wineries, and most of them are small family wineries. And that's why I mentioned the Casa de Piedra situation, because that changed the, the perspective of the, of the winery. When I, when I think in the winery industry, like example in California, United States, uh, well, we will, we will think, of course, in, in a lot of large wineries. Of course, there are small ones, of course, but mostly uh, the big number is big wineries, not here. Here we are talking about uh, very, very small production wineries that we are focused more in quality, no, not so much in quantity. We are putting our names in our labels, and of course, that is a big commitment, and we need to deliver good quality wine. I hope you are enjoying the, the Cabernet Tempranillo. In two minutes, we are going to change to the next wine. So if you want to start, want to, to start serving the Syrah Grenache Mourvedre, could be a good idea. I will, I will talk about that in two minutes. Okay. Pedro, excuse me, but can you tell us tell us a little bit more, and Gil, about uh, the wine we're drinking now? The wine that what? The wine the, the the wine that we're having now, the first wine. Yes, in the case of the first wine I I was mentioned before, um, it's a wine that has a very nice personality, full body wine that has a lot of expression in the mouth and in the nose. Uh, you can find uh, very complex aromas ripe red fruits, the oakness is very well balanced. In the mouth, you have a very long presence. You have a, in my case, I, I need to, to, to explain this uh, as a sommelier, wine is very important in the table with food. And of course, I like to produce wines that can uh, have good pairings. So, um, I tried from the vineyard, then in the winery, then in the barrel. I tried to that the, the, the final resort was a wine that has a, an important characteristic. You can you can taste it. You are you are feeling it right now. It's a very well balanced wine. It's not a wine that has a peak of acidity or astringency or or some something. It's a very well balanced wine. You can feel it in mouth. You can feel it also in the nose. And it's a wine that has a very nice expression. It's my, my philosophy. Produce well-balanced wines that can go uh, with more options of food. You can have uh, better pairings with a wine that is well-balanced than with a wine that uh, has uh, some peaks or something like that. 
So uh, right now, this this wine is uh, in a, its seventh year. Is a, a wine that has been evolving a lot. Is a mature wine. I think is a wine that is in the peak. Uh, definitely the better moment to 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 drink it. And I I hope that you are enjoying it and uh, is is good for you. Okay. Uh, well, just quickly, uh, when people think in 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 Baja California and in Guadalupe Valley, that is is normally what the people think in terms of wine, Guadalupe Valley. People think that here in Baja we have the largest vineyards in the country. Nope. The vi largest vineyards in the country are in Sonora, in the other side of the Sea of Cortez. Um, uh, that's interesting. Let me, let me open a, a, a little space. Um, the Sea of Cortez... Excuse me, Pedro. Excuse me, Pedro. Could you please uh, stop sharing your screen? Yep. Thank you. The Sea of Cortez, the official name is Gulf of California, but was discovered and was the first explorer and the first uh, Spain that was uh, navigating these waters was Hernán Cortés. That's why we call it, and almost everybody call it, uh, Sea of Cortés, but the, the original name is Gulf of California. Well, in the other part of the, the Gulf of California is Sonora, and you will find much more vineyards in Sonora than in Baja California. But the vineyards that are located in Sonora are more table grapes, not, not uh, good for, for wine making, because the weather over there is so hot and they don't, do not have these cold nights. And uh, well, conditions are different. And we are so close, but we are so different. So the Sonora vineyards are focused uh, more in, in, in grapefruit. And then uh, here is grape for winemaking. So that's uh, just an, another interesting situation. Well, so um, let me see. Here is, oops, what is happening? Oh, right there. Look, look this, um, these numbers, it's crazy, absolutely crazy. Almost 90% of the wine that is made it in, in Mexico is made it only by six companies, six wineries. Cheto, as I told you, produce 50% of the wine. Then Casa Madero in Coahuila, another important percentage is Santo Tomás here in Baja California, Freixonet in Querétaro, Montesanic and El Cielo here in Baja California also. They produce 88% of the wine. And the rest, the other 240,000 cases are divided in more than 200 wineries. As I told you before, small wineries, family wineries that are more focused in quality than in quantity. That is important to say because uh, that's uh, part of the identity of our region. When you think in Baja California wine regions, you need to add some names because almost, as I am saying that before, is almost everybody is talking about only what the Lupe Valley, but there are more valleys. Which are these valleys? Well, just in the border, Tecate in the surroundings, you can find some vineyards and some wineries. There is a valley, the Tecate Valley. Just in the south, Las Palmas Valley. Then you have Valle Seco. Then you have Valle de Guadalupe. Now, Valle de Guadalupe now is, is full of wineries and, and full of different projects. And uh, we have found that inside of Guadalupe Valley, we can talk about three different sub-regions, like uh, small appellations. One of them is Francisco Sarco, that is a town founded by the Russians. Then in the middle, you can find the El Porvenir town, that is another important sub-region. And finally, San Antonio de las Minas. What's the difference between, between these, these regions? Let me, let me show you here. I have a, a map. I have a map or I don't have a map? Uh, 
I have to, to get back a little bit. Here is the map. Guadalupe Valley is 20 kilometers long and five kilometers width. That's it, wide. That's it, no more. It's a very, very small valley. But when you get into the valley, the first town is San Antonio de las Minas. This town is close to the sea. And then Francisco Sarco is in the end of the valley. You need to drive the 20 kilometers to get to, some, to Francisco Sarco. And it's amazing because in summertime, when grapes are growing, you can find a very important difference in temperature between San Antonio de las Minas, that is fresh, closest to the sea, than Francisco Sarco, that is in the end of the valley and is but uh, if not a lot, it's more hot than that San Antonio. So inside of the Guadalupe Valley, you can, you can say, you can find, the, find these sub-regions. Other valleys, east of, uh, east of um, Ensenada, you can find here Ojos Negros. And then in the south, I already mentioned Santo Tomas and San Vicente Valleys. So those are the valleys that we have right now. Uh, almost nobody, nobody knows about this. But uh, I will say 60 or 70 percent of the grape that is processed is vinified in Guadalupe Valley is grape coming from Ojos Negros, San Vicente, Santo Tomas, etc. But Guadalupe Valley is the famous valley because it's well located, is where the wineries are for terms of the tourism. Everybody wants to get in Guadalupe Valley and visit the wineries, but these wineries are using not only grapes from Guadalupe, are using grapes from other, other regions. And for me, it's important to share this because we are bigger than, than the people think we are. In terms of, of grapes, it's interesting because we have a lot of different grapes and we have uh, different styles. Why? Because we have different conditions in each valley. Like example, Guadalupe Valley is a valley located uh, 10 kilometers from the sea and is 350 meters about sea level. But then you have Ojos Negros. Ojos Negros is 40 kilometers from the sea and is... Pedro, can, I, can I interrupt you for a second, Pedro? Yes. You, you, you talked Ojos Negros and I just wanted to say that, that the uh, second one that we're trying right now, the, the GSM, that's where it comes from. So hopefully you guys are trying the second wine. It's uh, the Grenache Syrah Morvedre. And I, the Syrah is from La Grulla, the Grenache is from Ojos Negros, and the Morvedre is from Valle de Guadalupe. That's correct. You anticipate one, one slide away from me, but it's okay. S sorry for interrupting. I just wanted to make sure we covered it. My lord, My apologies. Oh, I hope you have the, the Syrah Grenache Morvedre in, in your glass. And yes, he is totally right. In this case, the Syrah is coming from the south, a small, very, very small valley, very close to Santo Tomas, named La Grulla. Then the Grenache is coming from Ojos Negros. And I, I was telling you uh, that Ojos Negros is 40 kilometers from sea and is 950 meters above sea level. So Guadalupe Valley is here, Ojos Negros is much higher. Of course, Microclimate conditions are absolutely different. Guadalupe Valley is more hot. Ojos Negros is more fresh. The, the growing season in Ojos Negros, in Ojos Negros is longer. A concentration ripeness is usually bigger. And uh, in Guadalupe Valley, we have more sugar. That means more alcohol. But in Ojos Negros, we have more phenolic ripeness that means better aromas and better, better flavors. So that's the reason why the winemakers used to blend the grapes from different valleys. But in the future, I will say that as happens in all over the world, uh, we need to, to focus more in the, in the regions independently, and we need to start to give importance to other names as Ojos Negros or San Vicente or La Grulla. 
talking about the Syrah Grenache Mourvedre that you have in your glasses. This wine has 60% Syrah, 20% Grenache, and 20% Mourvedre. When we started to produce our wines in 2009, I asked myself what style of wine I wanted to produce. In that time, I was thinking in Mexican market because it's our biggest market. And in Mexico, people like a lot Spain wine. So the first wine I made was the Cabernet Tempranillo, that blend. That is the blend that uh, we are very familiar with that because it's the blend that they use in Rivera del Duero in Spain. And here in Mexico, we drink a lot of Spain wine from Rioja and Rivera del Duero. And grapes as Tempranillo are so familiar for us. So, well, then I decided, well, my first blend was going to be this Cabernet Tempranillo. You already have that. But then I wanted to produce a second label, a second wine. And then when I was thinking, what am I going to do now? Well, my favorite uh, wine region in France is not Bordeaux, is not Burgundy, as usually happens to almost everybody. My favorite wine region in France is the Rhone, the Rhone Valley. And then in Rhone Valley, you will find the Chateauneuf du Pape, the Corroti, Hermitage, Cross Hermitage, and other subregions and appellations. And the grapes, that are planted and used in, in Rhone Valley are normally uh, Syrah, Grenache, Morvedre, Sansol, Viognier, and other grapes. So thinking in that, well, I really love the wines from, from that region. And thinking in that, I just realized that these grapes are, are, are also very important in our valleys. So I will say, well, maybe I can do a, a Rhone Valley blend with the Mexican style and my personality uh, imprinted. So I decided to, to, to work with these grapes, Syrah, Grenache, and Murvedri. And uh, the wine also has 24 months in French oak barrel. Also, it's a wine that has a beautiful expression, very nice aromas, very uh, expressive. You can find, uh, again, mature red fruit, you will find the oak in very well balanced. In the mouth, probably you will find a little, a little bit more, more, uh, more fresh, a little bit more acidity, but it's very well balanced also with long flavor in mouth, good body, nice personality, good alert, a little bit in aromas, a little bit more fruitiness than the first one that it has more complexity and more oakiness. So um, this, this blend started to be very popular in the United States as a famous GSM. But I do not like to call my wine GSM because the main grape is not Grenache, it's Syrah. So I used to call, to call my wine SGM. Uh, the GSM are very famous and very popular. Mostly, right now, for me, the best in Paso Robles. Amazing, spectacular GSMs. And the region, of course, has different personality. And, uh, well, it's, it's just a matter of taste, which do you prefer. Uh, to, to end my presentation and uh, open a, a session of questions and whatever, I just want to show you in two minutes some images. Some of the, uh, for me, uh, more important wineries because are important in our history or because are important in terms of the quality of the wine. So here is Casa de Piedra. In this Casa de Piedra, we produce the Vino de Piedra. This winery belongs to Hugo da Costa, that is uh, one of the most famous winemakers in our region. And this winery for, for almost everybody that is involved in the wine industry right now is very important because this is the first small winery um, that started to produce good wine in 1997. So this winery for us is like our example that was possible to have a family project and produce a good wine. Then Uda Costa started another project, bigger one, that is Paralelo, where they produce Ensemble, Arenal and Colina. 
Another project, a small one again, you can find here, um, a Torres Alegre y Familia Winery. This is um, a winery that uh, is important because Victor Torres, that is the winemaker, he is doctor in enology by the Bordeaux University in France. So in terms of academic uh, level, he is the, the one that possesses the, the highest level. So his wines are amazing, very good ones, uh, very good ones, and uh, a little bit expensive, but I think, uh, well, quality, quality justify the price. Then here is Casa Magoni. Do you remember about Camilo? He has been here since 1965. He came from, from Italy, from the Milan region, and um, he was the winemaker from Cheto for almost 50 years. And uh, now he has his own winery with, with his family, and he is producing a very, very good wines. Also, Camilo, in these more than 60 years that he has been living here, he has been exploring the whole peninsula of Baja California. So if sometime uh, when we can travel again, uh, when, if sometime you come to Baja, I will recommend, uh, I re I will recommend that you visit uh, uh, Magoni, Magoni tasting room. And if you can, before that, make an appointment and you can ask for him to, to be here and have a nice talking with him. Believe me, will be one of the best experiences you can have here in the region. He knows, he knows everything about the history of Baja. He has a book, very good one. So uh, it's a very nice experience. Another important um, uh, winery I mentioned, here is Monte Chanique. This is an actual picture. Maybe you remember I, I, I had the old winery, white building uh, that was in the past. Now this is a very modern facility. A beautiful one, and the wines are very good too. Their best wine is Grand Ricardo. Uh, here is Mogorbadan Winery, a very small one, but amazing wine they are producing there. The family, the Badan family, arrived to to Guadalupe in the 40s. Henry Badan was the father from Switzerland, and uh, Doña Cleotilde, uh, the mom, was from France, and they established this uh, beautiful place. There is a restaurant in this in this uh, ranch, in this property that is amazing. You you have to to visit if you come. Dagmans, and the wine Mogorbadan wine is just fantastic. Here is another beautiful winery we have here in Guadalupe Valley, Adobe Guadalupe. This winery was established by a good friend Don Miller and his wife through the uh, beginning of the 2000s. Actually, 2001 is the first vintage they have. And the place is just beautiful. And also very uh, small property, uh, focus in quality, not much in quantity. Here is Santo Tomas. This winery is located in Santo Tomas Valley, 40 kilometers south from, from Ensenada. Here is Cheto. I usually don't go to, to Cheto because they are large producers and, and um, uh, well, facilities are not so nice. But I, I, I need to mention that one of their wines probably is the most famous Mexican wine here in Mexico. The Nebbiolo of Elia Cheto is a classic. Everybody has, in some moment of their lives, has, has been drinking this wine. So it's a large facility, not so nice as the others, but it, it's important. It's the largest producer, and Nebbiolo from Cheto is a very famous wine. That's why I am uh, showing this to you. And also Domecq, that, that uh, played uh, an important um, role in, in our history. Uh, was the first large winery, I will say, that we had in, in Mexico. Unfortunately, I mentioned that before, when Don Antonio Ariza uh, died, uh, the company was sold to a different companies. And unfortunately, no one could... Uh, uh, keep the, the wine making uh, in good quality. So company was lost for almost 20 years, but unbelievable. Now is uh, resuscitating. Is 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 in in a revert. What uh, why why is this happening? Because a Spain group, 
González González Villas is a, a group of uh, important a number of wineries in Spain. They bought again Domecq, and now Domecq is starting again to produce wine. They have a spectacular tour. If you come, you, you need to go with a, with a walk in a underground cellars they have with a lot of history. So it's, it's interesting. And his best wine that is Reserva Magna is, is one of my favorites. So to finish, if you ask me, Pedro, which are your favorite Mexican wines? Well, I will say the Querubiel from Adobe Guadalupe. I will say the Cabernet Sauvignon from Cru Garage, from Victor Torres Alegre. I will say, of course, Vino de Piedra. I will say Mogor Banan. I will say Gran Ricardo from Montichani. I will say Icaro from uh, Jose Luis Duran. Of course, I will say the Poncelis, Cabernet Sauvignon Tempranillo and Sira Grenache Murvedre. And I will say my new wines that are Vinicola Punto y Aparte wines that are going to be in the United States in, in the next weeks. And uh, it's a, a new project that I am starting with, with my family. Uh, Pedro, my son, is my oldest son. He's 18 years old now. He's starting to produce his own wine and, and we have other labels. So it's, it's actually a, a new project that we are going to, to keep growing. So if you want to learn a little bit more about what are we doing here, uh, talking about our wines, you can visit vinicola.aparte.com. We have, if you speak Spanish, we have this online wine school. You can uh, take uh, one of our courses, uh, wineschool.mx. And if you want to come, we can organize your trip. We have a company named at rutasdelvinomexicano.com. And if you want to get uh, more wine from De Poncelis or Vinicola Punto de Aparte or other wines that he'll and Eloisa has in the, the portfolio, you can contact Hill in hill uh, arroba vinos los And uh, also, I will share with you, you can visit my personal website, sommelierponcelis.com. And there in the, in the left corner, I have a, a chat. So sommelier, if you have a question, if you want to consult something, you can get in the website and you can uh, uh, visit the, the chat. Usually the chat goes to my phone and then I can answer your questions and I can uh, share with you whatever you need. And there is uh, Facebook and Twitter uh, 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 links. Okay, okay. So, uh, Pedro. Tell me. Thank you. That was amazing. And you did that without even drinking. There it is. There's your first drink. <laughs> As you can see, I've enjoyed it. <laughs> Actually, that's a prop. Um, John, uh, what can I tell you? you have... <laughs> it's good stuff. Great stuff. Great stuff. Uh -huh. we, have, we have a few questions, Pedro. Do we have a little time, Abelardo? Yes, we do. Go Main, right, Pedro. Uh, You're the boss. And... and we're getting some good uh, comments here from uh, the tasters. Uh, Parado uh, Silva says, excellent exposition uh, with the wine. Uh, our friend Hector Cruz Sandoval says, it's a delicious wine, a favorite of theirs from, uh, from Baja. Um, Petra Briones wants to know, is the region better known for red than white wines? Yes, that's right. Our Weather um, is better for red wine production. If you, if you think in the, which are the best regions for white wine, I am talking about Moselle in Germany, for Rieslings are amazing. New Zealand for Sauvignon Blanc, spectacular ones. Uh, Chardonnay in France, in Burgundy, and the most famous and more important white wines needs fresh, cold weather. And we do not have that. So what happened with the grapes? The grapes um, concentrate uh, more sugar, produce more alcohol, and do not produce the right amount of acidity. And the acidity is the most important thing 
in a white wine. So our white wines are not bad, mm -hmm. but they do not have this freshness that you can find in other cool wine regions. So in our case, we have hot conditions and these hot conditions helps to the red wine, to the red grapes, sorry, to get more, more ripeness, more concentrations of aroma, flavor and color. And that's why I was mentioning the beginning of the, of the talking, uh, that's why our style is that powerful, expressive, intensive uh, red wines. And our whites, I will say are okay, but we understand and we recognize and we know that are not the best of the world because we have these hot conditions. But we, we, we produce some, some good ones, not the best of the world, but good whites. And, and a related question, Pedro, from uh, Janet Herrera, who wants to know, uh, do you only make blends or do you produce any single varietals there? In the Poncelis, we only have blends, but in Punto y Aparte new project, we will have some varietals. Actually, okay. The first one, that, the first wine that uh, Pedro, my son, made it last year, 2019, was uh, a Nebbiolo. So he, he will launch a 100% Nebbiolo uh, in the next month. Right now it's in barrel. So I will say uh, beginning of 2021 is going to be ready and is going to be um, uh, a varietal. And I will have to say that in the new project, in, in Punto de Aparte project, I am working more in fruity, fruity, in more fruitiness, more freshness, less oak, not so complex wines, more easy to drink and also cheaper. It's important. So it's, it's expanding different styles. But yes, okay. we will so a uh, one variety wines. Uh, Allison, uh, I think, Al yeah, Allison Sotomayor here, our friend, wants to know if you make a Malbec in uh, Valle. No, yes, in, in Valle, yes, there is, a, there is some Malbec in the region, uh -huh. a few acres. It's not the, the most important uh, uh, grape in, in our region. In our region, we are more focused in the, you know, powerful grapes. I am talking Cabernet Sauvignon. Tempranillo, Sinfandel, Sira, Nebbiolo, the big ones. Mm -hmm. With Merlot and Carmener, I will say are a one to ten, eight. Cabernet, mm -hmm. Nebbiolo, Sinfandel, Sira, Tempranillo, nine. You see? So we are more focused in nines or tens. We have Merlot, we have Carmener, and we have Malbec. But those are not the most important grapes. Mm -hmm. um, what we have with Malbec is, is good, but I think our weather is a little bit hot for Malbec. When we think in Malbec, obviously we are going to think in Argentina. Mm -hmm. And when we understand what is the situation of the Malbec in Argentina, in vineyards that are located in the foot of the um, Andes mountains, between 1,500 to 2,200 or more meters above sea level, the weather is, is, is more fresh, is more cold. And that's why Malbec in Argentina, in Mendoza particularly, has an amazing expression. But here we are very close to sea level with more hot, not so fresh, and Malbec works good, but not in his best way. I will have to say that uh, it's amazing when you get, uh, you know, deeper in, in this, this wine world. Uh, we need to remember the vines, the plants are, are living beings. And they, as we do, we react to the to our conditions and there are there are like example in my case when i am in a city that is so hot oh my god i want to kill myself is is terrible for me i don't i do not like the, the hot weather and but some people is really happy there mm -hmm. and my case i love cold but, but like example 
our we go city and it's like oh this is freezing no it's okay it's wonderful but you see i want to, to just trying to explain that the plants also adapt in different regions here in in baja then we have malbec not in in his best expression very good malbec but i think the best still is from from mendoza okay and hector hector uh, sandoval wants to know is it true that a mexican cab won first place in a European wine contest? That's true. That's it's true. true, huh? Yes. I have to say, uh, unfortunately, it was not from Bacup. <laughs> ah, well, it's okay. Um, no, 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 no. It's okay. It's okay. It's a wine. Talking talking about these special conditions. Um, in the future, if you want and if you have time, maybe we can talk about other wine regions. This wine that just won a, a man in a big important contest uh, named it as the best Cabernet of the world. Uh, this, this winery is located in Coahuila. It's located close to Parras de la Fuente, but is a special vineyard located at 2,200 meters above sea level. It's one of the highest, highest vineyards in Mexico and one of the highest vineyards in the world. So again, microclimate over there is so special. The name of the winery is Don Leo. And uh, yes, they, they got the prize. That's uh, amazing for, for Mexican wine industry because that helped us to the whole country to start to get this international recognition. The first idea that comes to, to almost everybody's mind is, oh, must be Baja wine. No, I have to be honest. It's Coahuila wine, but it's really good. Don Leo. Can you, Gil? Do you know? Can you can you purchase that here in in the uh, market? You no, know, I, so. I think they haven't started exporting to the U.S. market. Yeah. Okay. It, it's it's uh, one of those things that we maybe we could reach out to them and see once they're ready, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, the customs and all that stuff. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll send them an email just to follow up and see where they're at. Yeah. They've got some uh, customers. Okay. And I just uh, just uh, want to know, after seeing the uh, pictures of the Russian history, Pedro, now we know where you got your beard. You know, you look uh, you look very Russian there, right? <laughs> it's my and, look. <laughs> yeah, and of course, it's interesting, too, that um, you talked about how the climate in Baja is very similar to here in L.A. And L.A. was the largest wine-producing region in the country in the 1800s. So we have a long history with wine here as well. That's right. Actually, uh, again, if uh, someday you want to talk about just California, not Baja, just California history, I have also an amazing presentation with the history of the California wine from San Diego. Uh, the first mission in, San, in California was established in 1769 from, from, by Junipero Serra. And then uh, it started to, uh, to, to develop the ingredients. But in the beginnings, uh, we're in the surroundings of LA, exactly, where uh, people, French people particularly, started to plant thousands of acres and was uh, a very important wine region. Actually, there are some um, uh, small wineries yet located in the in the east of LA, in the Cucamonga uh, region, uh, you will find the Cucamonga Valley. Actually, it's an official American viticultural area. And in, well, unfortunately, there are no more vineyards in the region. Now it's more populated, but usually grapes are coming from the surrounding mountains. And in, well. Uh, was the the first I think uh, LA was the first large wine uh, region in 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 California definitely. So uh, is the the history how missionaries again started to develop these missions and these valleys and how wine growing and wine making started to develop in California is also amazing and also not only California, what is happening with the wine in the United States in the whole country. Is, is also very interesting. I don't know if you have this, this info in mind, but uh, in 
each one of the whole states of the American Union, you will find a vineyard and a winery. In each one of the 50, or I don't remember how many states you have, in all of them, you will find at least wine winery. Even Florida doesn't have a nice water for wine growing and wine making. They have vineyards and they have wine making. So it's, it's really interesting. You will let me know if, if uh, in some time you want to talk about that. And, and I would love to share what I know about the California wine and, and the rest in the United States. Pedro, right now, we, we, have to, we have to hold on for the next one that we're going to bring you on. But for now, we'd like to hear from Gil to tell us just a little bit about your venture, Vinos de Los Angeles. So, so one of the things that Pedro was talking about is that we've had that relationship with his, with his wines, the, uh, the, the, the CT, Captain Franillo, and the GSM. And he's also uh, working on his new project that we're, we, we have a sample here that we've uh, actually started to work on all the legalities. So I'm, I'm thinking within about a month, we're going to have his uh, new wines here. This is, this is Punto Dos. So he does have a Punto Uno, Punto Dos, and he also has a, a, a very uh, nice rosé. It, it's called uh, <clears throat> Punto y Aparte, the, uh, the Grenache. So, you know, Pedro is a, a very resourceful person. He's been in the business for quite some time. He's a great winemaker. So uh, I'm just happy that we could share him with you guys. Because I, I met Pedro a couple of years back and, and I, I, I told myself, this is the kind of person you have to share with people because he's got so much knowledge. And every time I talk to him, I have seen this presentation before, but it's, you keep learning. It's, he's, he's a good guy to, uh, you know, uh, have, have in your pocket in, in a sense. So we like working with him. He's an educator. He's a good person to, to know. And, you know, it's, it's one of the things that we love sharing. So whenever you guys, whenever you visit El Valle de Guadalupe, please send us an email. We we're more than happy to, to kind of direct you. You know, uh, Pedro de Poncelis, he, on top of being a winemaker, he also does these, uh, these, you know, cater tours. Yeah, whatever you want to do in El Valle as far as visit, uh, you know, more commercial wines or, um, you know, more boutique wines. He, he uh, knows everybody there. So he's, he's a good person to know. I hope he's you guys enjoy job. both lines. I'm on my, my GSM. I'm about to open it up. He's a, a great uh, the first one. Gil, Gil and Pedro are the best, and Eloisa, the best tour guides you could ever want to take you to, uh, to Baja. And as I said, La Plaza did uh, do a tour there last year. We uh, we plan to do another just as soon as we can we can get back. Is is the Valle open now, Pedro? Can uh, can people uh, go and visit? Actually, tomorrow, uh, Bali is reopening, only only with twenty wineries because government is asking to the wineries um, a lot of um, things to to protect the visitors. So we will need to to have a like a special filter to to welcome the people, uh, take temperature, sanitizing, and a lot of things. So people are right now uh, getting the equipment and everything. Tomorrow, 20 that are already are opening again. But I have to be honest with you. Uh, I I'm not sure if this is the best moment to to open again, mm -hmm. because in in the country. Here in Ensenada, believe me, the problem is really quiet. The problem, the most important or more difficult situation is in Mexico City. That is crazy. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, reopening, my, my problem is that if, if we are okay, if we are welcoming, welcoming people and we in trouble, then we for harvest season that starts in, in July, August, and, and that is going to be complicated. So it uh, probably will be better uh, wait a little bit until uh, probably, I don't know, September. But uh, well, in any case, if you want to come, there are going to be some wineries open uh, from tomorrow. Uh, and in the next week, the next weeks, 
more wineries are going to reopen and also hotels and also restaurants slowly but are going to start from tomorrow to reopen and and let's see what happened in the in the next weeks okay good good i just i just want to thank all the all the people who have tuned in to some of the names here uh lydia junction is that right lucy hernandez chief Ba hills my sister irene Pes <laughs> pesquera no, ie and her husband frank uh, my other sister lydia kobayashi uh allison sotomayor edgar mahia jesse nunez angelica yokio Yo Maribel Hernandez Palomero, Palomera, of course, who um, uh, spends a lot of time out in the valley, and uh, Adriana Mendoza from AERP, and our board member, our, our famous, uh, our best uh, wine colleague, uh, Art Torres, and uh, Yvonne, and Hector Cruz Sandoval, and Rosa Maria Marquez, and David Damian Figueroa out in uh, the de desert, and my old friend Kathy Doria out in Texas uh, somewhere. Forgot what city you're in, Kathy and Raul Madrano in uh, Orange County, and uh, our board member, um, Catcher on Hentified, uh, Dr. Alma Martinez has joined us too, along with many, many others. So thank you all for, for being with us tonight. And uh, schedule a trip down there is uh, when you can, when, when things are, you know, when back, are back to normal. And Gil, any thoughts about the best places to find these wines here in, in town? You know, there's there's a couple of places that do sell them, but unfortunately, I think they're still kind of uh, you know they're they're uh, they're not 100% open. We we do sell sell this, these wines to a lot of uh, restaurants in downtown. There's also La, La Casita Mexicana in the city of Bell that sells them for retail. So if you have any questions, you know they're, they're available. Just send me an email. It, it, it's on the website. It's uh, Gil at Vinos Los Angeles, and we'll definitely guide you guys where to buy them. And, and one of the things, I, I don't like to talk about this, but I'll, I'll throw it out there. Some of the restaurants in downtown sell one glass for a lot more than you get a bottle. So it, it's definitely because of John and the plaza, we, we're, we're, we're very, uh, we're, we're price driven. So we will definitely give you guys a, a good, good price point. Good. And I, I should note too that when we do events at La Plaza and when we get back to doing events, we serve wines too. So if you're coming out for a salsa concert uh, or one of our other events that we produce, you can uh, you can enjoy some uh, Baja wine there with us. Thank you for that. Yeah, we support we support you all. I have a question for you, John. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have uh, some date to reopening La Plaza? We, are, uh, we have been cleared now by the county so we're looking at uh, a time in early July. We'll be uh, working on plans next week. We want to be sure we have a safe environment for everyone, but uh, it looks like it could be early July that we open again, although we won't be able to do any events on site for the rest of the year. Um, for you. Yeah, but, but we'll be there. So the galleries will be open and uh, people can see, come in and see the exhibits that we have. Lovely. Yeah. But in the meantime, yes. while we're waiting for La Plaza de Cultura y Artes to reopen our museum and then to begin with our events again, you have En Casa con La Plaza. So thank you very much, Gil, Pedro, and John for this wonderful and tasty yes. demonstration presentation. And you could catch the next one coming up on Monday, Tortitas en Cazuela with Dora Herreras from the world famous James Beard award-winning Yucas. So that's on Monday at June, tw June 22nd at three o'clock. Next week, we also have Ebony Bailey, a filmmaker and photographer with her presentation on documenting Afro-Mexicanos. She's a documentarian and a filmmaker. Happy Juneteenth, everybody. And then finally on Friday, for, this is just for next week. We have Dan, Ge Dan Guerrero returning with his happy hour with his guest, Nicolas Gonzalez. And on Sunday, let me, this is our first Sunday show. It's a special LBGTQA plus uh, presentation called Quirentina and Soul, a partnership with Tamarindo podcast. And that'll be Sunday from 11 to 1 with some 
wonderful dance class sessions, mindset coaching sessions, and a musical performance. You could catch these, all of our archived, this one that we did today, along with all the past ones, this is our eighth week at lapca.org. That's our website, lapca.org. Also on YouTube at La Plaza LA and also on Facebook at La Plaza LA. We'd like to thank our sponsors, AARP California and Walmart for making this possible. And we hope you join us again. And we hope to have Gil and Pedro, and of course, John's gonna be back for the next one, for one coming up. We'll have to schedule it because there was just so many comments, so many questions particularly about California wines. And we're gonna do it again, aren't we? Yes, right. yes. We will, it will be my pleasure. Well, thank you thank so much, everybody. You guys. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a safe drive home. And if you're already <laughs> here, <laughs> if anybody needs wines, we have them available. Thank, thank you, everybody. A big hug from, from our house to your house. We appreciate your, your uh, support. John Abelardo, Pedro, thank you for everything. All right, you're welcome. Out there, also a big hug from from our house to your house. Bring 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 Eloisa in too, Gil. <laughs> Come on, Eloisa, say hi. There we go. Oh, yes, I'm here. They're our team. They're the, that's the wine team. The bottle is empty, but not not all because of me. Because of Louisa helped me. Yes. Uh, so good. Help behind the scenes. <laughs> yes, and we're Very home, good. so it's allowed. All right. The the, uh, the biggest problem is we're probably going to fall asleep on the couch. <laughs> Okay, buenas noches todos. Okay. And we'll see you soon. Yes. Un abrazo. In, in okay. Casa. Thank you, Pedro. Salud. Salud. Thank you, guys. Hasta Bye. la próxima en casa Thank con la casa. Buenas noches.